thanks for thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the opportunity. This is literally the second talk that I've given on on targets um, officially. So it's is super exciting. Um, so I come from the life sciences, and we develop ambitious workflows for statistics and data science. And so there's a lot of Bayesian analysis, machine learning, et cetera, that goes on. And these projects require long run times. So Markov chain Monte Carlo, deep neural nets, they're expensive. They take several minutes or even hours just to fit a single model. So when the code is under rapid development, we run into trouble fairly easily. A large workflow has a bunch of moving parts. If you change one of these stages, then everything that depends on it is no longer valid. And you need to rerun the computation in order to bring the output back up to date. The changes like this happen all the time. They, they, they usually happen in development much faster than it actually takes to run the project. And there's, there's no way the results can keep up if this happened. Unless you use a, a pipeline tool and in this case, more specifically, a make-like pipeline tool to avoid repeating yourself. There's some great pipeline tools for workflow automation in general, but historically not a whole lot for R. And it matters because if you use a tool like make, it can often obstruct your style of programming. If, you're, if you implement your workflow as a package, or if you implement your workflow as a bunch of functions, and you have to fit into this scripted style that allows make to track dependencies among, among code files and artifacts, it's, it gets pretty awkward. Um, I definitely experienced this during my dissertation, which is one of the original motivations for how I got involved in designing this kind of tool in the first place. And for today, this is where the targets package comes in. So targets is a make-like pipeline tool that is fundamentally designed for R. You can invoke it in an R session, it supports a clean, idiomatic, function-oriented style of programming. And it helps you store and retrieve the results and abstract files as R objects. And most importantly, it gets you out of the Sisyphean loop of long computation. It enhances reproducibility, and it takes a lot of the frustration out of data science. But what about Drake? So Drake is a package that already does this. It's been around for four years and it's never going away. I will still maintain it. And in fact, just today I pushed an update to CRAN. However, Drake is has Drake has improved so much over the last four years that we've we kept together with the community, we've solved solvable problem after solvable problem that eventually it got as good, pretty much as good as we can make it. And we were forced to confront with the unsolvable problems. We, we were left with the, the systematic limitations that Drake is stuck with. Limitations so deep in the architecture that we can't actually fix them without breaking the tool or existing projects that use it. And refactoring and all that technical debt is, is an uphill battle. And to move that general capability forward of pipeline okay. tools in R, beyond what Drake will ever be capable of, we need a new package. And that successor is, is targets. And next couple of, of slides are gonna assume some familiarity with Drake, but for those of you who are familiar with Drake, this is, this is for you. Um, so these are the pain points that targets solves that are unaddressable in Drake itself. So first of all, targets is less flexible less flexible intentionally. Less flexibility is actually a good thing here. So targets runs the pipeline in a clean new R process by default. It, it, it spins up a brand new session and it loads everything and then runs targets within that session. Um, you can opt into this in Drake, but it's, it's not the default and there's some reasons why it never will be. Um, targets enforces this and makes it much easier to do, which, keeps people from tripping themselves up. You know, a lot of users who I, who I can think of in particular have, have developed techniques and tools to try to speed through the process of setting up a pipeline and running it, but 
that often leads to stale R sessions and and ways in which workflows can invalidate themselves or be invalidated accidentally. And the reasons why the setup and the execution should be separated. And there's a, there's a point in between where you really wanna stop and pause and think and check that the workflow is, is connected properly before, before you commit to running a long computation. I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit when we get to the example, but targets force, force keeps people from tripping themselves up. Um, similarly, it, it has stricter policies about how you set up the projects a, as a file system. So the, there's a, it, it needs to run always from the working directory of the project. There's a configuration file that always needs to be there and it's always called the same thing. The data store is always in, in, in a predictable format in a predictable location and it needs to be at the project root. Things like that were areas of flexibility in Drake that rarely ever were useful and more often than not got people into trouble. And so targets nails all that down, makes it more reproducible, more dependable and smoother and more convenient for the user. It takes a lot of the frustration out of it. And speaking of that data store, Drake's cache actually has a, a large number of cryptically named files. If you've looked at the, the dot Drake folder and seen this confusing nest of, of files, this is, this is what I'm talking about, the, the file schematic that I'm showing here. Um, so Drake uses an external third-party data management package because when I created this and had a million other pro problems to think about how to solve, it was hard to tackle just this on its own. And I, I didn't really know what, what the priorities were or what to optimize for. But um, experience with this has, has um, has helped us learn a lot. So the, the data store that you get from the store package itself is, is great. It's, it's a key value store that's designed for, for, for certain areas of, of, of common types of efficiency that you want. And the default backend is designed for efficient parallel reads and writes and things like that. And um, that's, that's all good. So there's nothing wrong with the design of store, but it can be hard to take some set of results, a data store or cache, and move it to another computer system for the sake of portability. Maybe you want to share with your colleagues. Um, and Drake actually took it a little bit took it a little bit too far by by um, having um, by by defining a, a lot of namespaces, uh, storage namespaces, like you see under this under this key directory. Um, ideally, for efficiency's sake, this would be kept to a minimum, but um, Drake is, is irrevocably committed to a large number of these, which exacerbates the problem. So what he did in targets is, is decided, well, we're just going to have one file per target by, by default, unless you choose alternative storage, which we can get to. And, um, and a database, a data table file with the metadata and a data table file for the progress. And so the number of files is always going to be the number of targets plus two. And this great re greatly reduces the, the volume and storage, the, the file quota that's required. And it, it just helps, it helps you understand things. It helps you move the, the, the data store to another file system and collaborate. Version control has an easier time. So for small projects of small data, you can actually put this under version control with Git and GitHub with, with much, e much more easily. You can use similar tools like Dropbox and OneDrive. They struggle far less often. And if you just look at this cache, you, you look at it and immediately understand what's going on. You, in, and you, you know how it's organized. And only this meta file is, is sacred. Um, pretty much any other file can break. And you can diagnose the problem very easily. And in fact, if, if one of the files is corrupted or missing, then, then it, when you run the pipeline, it'll repair itself far more easily. Um, so it's more robust and less brittle than what Drake was using. Even more exciting is that this cleanup and redesign allowed, allowed me to implement something that was extremely hard, if not impossible, to implement in Drake, which is seamless integration with Amazon S3. So I, I got this idea actually by observing Metaflow. Metaflow is a pipeline, is an excellent airflow-like pipeline tool that recently that recently acquired its R bindings. Um, 
And I mean, there, there are reasons why um, I, I tend to stick with make like pipeline tools, but I played around with Metaflow and I, I, I liked a lot what they were doing with the, with the cloud and I'm trying to learn from it. And this is one example. Um, so when you run a pipeline that looks like this, what, what will happen is every time, every time you, you reach a step in the pipeline and you, you build a data set or build a model, if you, if you do a little bit, a bit of config, what targets will automatically do is it'll send that data to the cloud and it'll track it and it'll watch it for changes. And it, with, with just a little config, this happens automatically. And not only that, cloud storage reading, reading targets that, that, were, that live in the cloud feels exactly the same as reading targets that, lives lo that live locally. So another advance is in the advancement is in the introspection of things like the graph. So Drake has ways of telling you which parts of your workflow are outdated and which are up to date, um, but it struggles to tell you what's going on with functions. So targets can tell you this a lot more easily. So in this graph, we see that this, this create plot function in our workflow is, is out of date. It's, it changed since the last time we ran the pipeline. And and the targets that are downstream of that are, are out of date. And so it can tell you what, what it's you know, the role of functions and what work gets skipped and what workflow actually needs to run. And it, it, makes, it makes debugging your workflow, you know, why are my targets out of date? Those questions are a lot easier to answer. Um, and I realize this is, this is a bit advanced, but we can circle back. Um, I just wanted at, this, at the beginning of this, of this presentation to present sort of what's, what's new and why this package needs to exist. Um, but I can, I can answer questions about any of this when we're, when we're done and it'll make more sense as we go forward. So dynamic branching is a big piece. Um, and, and in Drake, it was, it was a long requested feature and it was super hard to implement. We got it done, it works but it has limitations. And one of those limitations is the kinds of, of aggregation and branching models you can have with sort of different, sort of different ways to treat your data. Um, dynamic branching and targets is more flexible. You can literally take a data frame, group it with dplyr, and then dynamically branch over the subsets to parallelize and split up the computation. So this is a feature that people have been asking about asking for in Drake for years. It's a super common use case. And because targets is dynamic to the core, it is now possible. Drake struggled because it was it it had infrastructure that didn't anticipate that there was going to be a need for dynamic branching at all. Um, dynamic branching is far more efficient too. So Drake was limited because, like I said, the the architecture treated treated everything as static. So everything, every, every target that you declared had to be declared up front in advance. Um, targets is, is um, so dynamic branching was difficult to sort of retrofit to Drake, but, but I had this in mind in right from day one with targets. And actually this is, this is still the most difficult feature to implement, but it, now it has the structure to handle it properly. So instead of being limited by this sort of map reduce paradigm where you had different stages and they all have to get joined or finalized or, or reduced in order to move on, you have this situation where you have a bunch of parallel steps, you have a bunch of parallel steps that, that depend on each of the previous ones. And some steps can proceed when their dependency is complete, but some even, even if some stages are trying to catch up, and this, this, this makes your, your work get done faster and it, it decreases computing resources that are needed. And finally, targets is much easier to extend and build on. You know, I noticed some people both externally and at my work trying to build interfaces on top of Drake. And that's, that's really hard because Drake has its own domain specific language then, and it forces you into that. Um, unless you want to take the Drake plan data frame and manipulate it, but you know, and I anticipated people would do that, but it's it's something that that almost that turned out to almost never happen. Um, but so targets anticipates this. It it resists having a domain specific language, and it 
it allows you to interact with the, the interface to define a pipeline without and optionally sort of opt out of any non-standard evaluation. And this allows people to develop custom interfaces. And it's the reason why we and and I've 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 started to tap into it with the, the Tarkitypes package, which defines a bunch of archetypes to make things like interaction with our markdown reports in a way that accounts for dependencies a far easier task. Um, and I'll go over, I'll demonstrate our markdown integration um, later on. Okay. So that's all that was for the benefit of people who were who were who were coming to this saying, okay, um, targets is a successor to Drake. Why, why does there need to be a successor? Um, and so I think I've, I've answered that question. So let's, let's backtrack now for, to, to, start, to start even earlier. So what is an example where we would use a pipeline toolkit and how would a pipeline toolkit help? Um, so let's, to, to consider that, let's, let's take an example in Bayesian statistics. Um, if you don't know Bayesian statistics, that's totally fine. It's just, it's just a task where we're fitting a model and trying to validate it. So we have this, this model is sort of a, a, a how Bayesian statisticians would, would write a, a specification for a model. We have some independent identically distributed observations that, that depend on some linear trend plus some, plus some, some random error. And this is, this is pretty much a regression model, but in Bayesian form. And what we do a lot at my work is we, we set up Bayesian models for, for the life sciences, and we, we need to make sure that we've, we've implemented them correctly. And one of the ways to do this in a Bayesian setting is to fit them multiple times, is to simulate data sets from, from this model multiple times and fit this exact model to the data set and it at each time, and then verify that, um, and for, for, each, for each model fit, we take the 95% the credible intervals for, or 90% or credible intervals in this case for parameters, which credible intervals are kind of like confidence intervals, but have a different interpretation and are calculated differently. But they're, they're very similar. We want, we want us to show that you know, if we implemented our model correctly, that 90% of the credible intervals that we calculated cover the true value of the parameter that was used to generate the data. So that's, that's our goal. And Bayesian statistics is usually computationally intense because our models are not easily expressible in closed form, or the, the integrals of the posterior distribution, to, to be specific. Um, so this, this requires a bunch of approximation methods, usually Markov chain Monte Carlo, and that's where all this computation comes into play. And it's usually very, very long, especially when you're running a model thousands of times. And so this is exactly the sort of situation where we'd want a pipeline tool because we're, we're changing the model, we're changing the code, we're changing the data a lot. And yet this computation runs so long that we, we want some way to, to mitigate that, to be able to skip steps that are already up to date. We're gonna implement this model in a programming language called STAN. It's a domain specific language for statistics and optimization. And this is, this is like a, a, a very simple relatively simple stand model relative to the, the space of stand models that are out there. Um, and it's, and, and this is, it's, the model is, is pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's one of the great things about stand is it, it's very interpretable. Um, it's, it is strongly typed. So you do have to declare your data types, your parameters. Um, and, um, but, but it's all here. And if you were here on earlier in the call, we talked about function, functional programming versus, versus imperative programming. Um, so R is a, is a function-oriented language and targets is a function-oriented tool. And so we're gonna move away from these numbered scripts and not just because functions are, are more suited to the language, more idiomatic. Um, it's because this, this approach with, with numbered scripts it's, it's fine for small projects, but it tends to not scale very well. Things tend to get unmanageable very quickly. And so we're going to move to functions, just reusable pieces of code that take some well-defined arguments and return a single value. And 
functions decompose things into much more manageable pieces. And the modularity is, is critical for these large projects that we're, that we're talking about. And usually our functions are going to fall into three different categories. They're, they're most often either going to produce a data set or analyze a data set or summarize something, either a model or, or a data set. And this is one of those functions. We're, we're going to draw our parameters from distributions and then produce a data set generated from the model. And similarly, there's a function to fit the data. We call the CMD stan R package, which is, is it, it's under development, but it's super nice for fitting stan models. And it's, it's far less error prone at the low level. Um, you run into compilation and um, issues far less often. And we're just gonna fit the model and return what, what I'm calling here the truth, whether, um, whether the 90% the credible interval is, captures the true value of the parameter that generated the data. And then we have a bunch of utility functions. Uh, the top level functions are gonna be data sets analyses and summaries usually, but they're composed of a lot smaller functions that, that, that further decompose those ideas into reusable and, and more importantly, understandable shorthand that make your code easier to read. The shorthand is what these functions are all about. And we do have a file structure, but it's gonna look a bit differently. So it's gonna look a little bit more like a package, not necessarily exactly a package. Um, you can write, there are ways to write workflows as packages that interface well with targets, um, but you don't need to go that far. And in fact, Miles McBain has some, some great arguments why you might not actually want to go that far, but there are some useful patterns here. Configuration files at the top level and functions inside a folder that I'm calling R. Um, so we'll have our functions in these two scripts, our stand model here. Maybe there's another folder for your data if you use data files. And at the top level, we have this special file called underscore targets.r. This configuration file is required by targets and it must exist at the root of the project. And this is part of that paternalism that keeps users from tripping themselves up. So in targets.r, we, we load the packages that we need to define the pipeline. We load our functions, set some options that make it more convenient. Maybe, maybe you have a cluster and you, you set some options to, for the cluster MQ, MQ package, which targets can talk to in order to distribute your work to multiple different nodes, multiple different computers. And you set the packages that, you're, that, that, that are going to need to run the pipeline. Um, this is, this is optional, but it makes startup a lot faster if you do if you set your, your runtime packages this way. And next, on to the main event. So you're going to define a pipeline with the tar pipeline function. So pipeline is just your data analysis workflow from beginning to end, up you know, beginning with, with data set generation and ending with those summaries and reporting. And each step of this pipeline is called a target. Now, it, now, a target borrows from the, the terminology of, of make, and it's, it's traditional in computing. And all it means is, is a skippable step in a pipeline. So a step to fit a model or a step to fit a data set. Maybe that step is, is out of sync with its dependencies. It needs to rerun. Maybe, maybe it's our, this target is already up to date and it can be skipped. Um, so target is that kind of skippable step. And it has a name. It has a, a, an expression in R. This is just R code. It could be a function call, but it can just be any expression. And it returns a value. And we call it for its value and not its side effects. So usually you're going to have targets to, again, just like functions to create a data set, analyze a data set, or summarize something. And there are a bunch of different settings that you can, that you can input as well. And all we're doing right now is compiling the model. So stand models need to be compiled down to, uh, they need to be pre-processed into C++ code and then, and then compiled, um, that, that C++ code gets compiled so the underlying Hamiltonian Monte Carlo routine can, can run faster than otherwise. Um, and all we're doing is compiling that model and setting a couple of targets we're gonna use later and we're going to generate some of our first data. 
And we're going to stop there because building up a pipeline is an iterative process. So what, what I highly recommend doing is just running a first few, the first couple targets, stopping there, checking your work, adding some more targets gradually, and then repeating. And this combines the, the formal pipeline automation with the exploratory data analysis in ways that are very constructive and allow a clean workflow to develop. So once we have this pipeline, the targets package like Drake can analyze the commands in the, the functions you have in your workflow and automatically put together a directed acyclic graph representation of what's going on. So index batch and index sim are targets and they're upstream of this data continuous target down, down here. And the, 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 the targets depend on these functions, visualize these triangles, and this is detected automatically. So what targets does is it crawls through your code with static code analysis. And without actually running the code, it can detect the symbols that you use. And it automatically knows that data continuous depends on index sim. And the reason here is because index sim is mentioned in the, um, in the, in the dynamic branching command of, of, of this data continuous target. Likewise, the simulate data continuous function is mentioned in the command. And this is a custom function you defined in your environment. And so that's a dependency of this data continuous target. And that's how it shows up on this graph. And so what you need to do as a developer or a, or a user is just worry about each individual step and targets deduces how this all fits together. When you actually run the pipeline, it's, it's pretty simple. Once you have all that set up, you just call the tar make function. And what this does is it calls the correct targets in the correct order. And for each target, it stores the value in that data store that, that I mentioned that's more efficient than, than what Drake has. And it abstracts that, that target, that return value as, as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as an R object later on. Uh, we have multiple branches of the data continuous target because we, what we've done here is we've said pattern equals map index batch. So index batch is gonna be the sequence of integers from one to 25. And what pattern equals map index batch is saying, okay, for, for, each, for each index batch, well, for each index batch, we're going to run this command. And this is, this is, this is just a loop. This is, this is what it means to be a loop in functional programming. The, the map reduce filter paradigm of functional programming is, is sort of the, one of the most reachable and ubiquitous pieces of functional programming in R. Um, there, there are deeper aspects of pure functional programming that, are, that the R community doesn't usually use, but this is, this is one of them. And if you're familiar with packages like per, which are even called here, this is, this is similar thinking. So we run our pipeline and if we call the graph again or other utility functions, we can see that, hey, our targets are up to date because we just ran them and they're up to date with the code and data that generated them. Nothing changed since last time. The tar read function makes it really easy to inspect the data. So this is where exploratory data analysis happens. And this is how, this is, this is how files are abstracted as R objects. You can, you can just pass the symbol, the target name, and if it's, uh, if it's dynamically branched, you can, you can tell it which branch indices that are being loaded and it loads, it loads the data set. And you can inspect the data in your console really easily without having to worry about where files are stored. And so you've run an automated pipeline and now you're interactively manually exploring it and checking it for errors. And so it's this, this back and forth process that, that we're going on. And if we like what we see in the data, if things were generated correctly, that's the time to move on and add more targets. So we're satisfied with the data, we fit it using the, the, the model that we've defined. And now we explore again, this is where we've added targets and we pause and we think, well, is the, is the, the, the pipeline connected correctly? Are the dependency relationships being detected? Did I set up the workflow properly before I commit to several hours of runtime? And the answer here is yes, because this fit continuous depends on the data continuous and the model. 
so we're good to go. And this is a much longer computation. So this time I run it on, on the cluster. You know, before I mentioned the options to talk to cluster MQ, and this is this tar make cluster MQ function listens to those. You can you can set any number of, of workers that are supported. I don't recommend going above a hundred or so because then then none of those workers may be occupied. But this is where it skips the model, it, the model compilation, it skips the data because it's already up to date, and it only runs the actual models. And that runs them in a way that, that parallelizes across distributed computing workers on a cluster. And likewise, we inspect the output. So I recommend returning really simple data structures, simple and light data structures when you can. So um, data frames are really nice. Um, if you set the right formatting options, targets can compress them down into a manageable size. They become really useful this way. And um, not only that, I, I recommend in Bayesian statistics scenarios to avoid returning all of the MCMC samples uh, because it just takes up a lot. I, I recommend just returning summary statistics like these, um, plus you know credible intervals and and you know, other sort of rep by rep numerical summaries. And this looks good. So we're going to go ahead and and visualize the graph just to make sure that you know, what things are, things are up to date as they should be. Um, for me, this took a total of, of you know, if, if we add up the runtime of all those models, it, it was about, um, four, it was about 40, 43, 44 minutes. Um, so by skipping this step, um, we, in, in subsequent runs of the pipeline, we save a whole lot of time. So now we're going to fit a discrete version of this model where where our, our covariate is, is discrete. Um, and we're gonna simulate some data to that effect. And we're also gonna make another change. We're, and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna fit a similar model as well, but we're also gonna add a dependency aware R markdown report where we load um, in, in this line I'm, I'm down here, where you load different upstream targets in the pipeline and the targets package actually knows what to do with that. You could you could either run this report in um, in in the console by clicking the knit button in the R Studio IDE, or you could run it in a pipeline with this tar render function from the targetypes package. And when we look at this graph again, because targetypes the the tar render function actually crawls through the report and detects dependencies automatically, it knows it depends on these models as well as the, the functions and data upstream of that. And so when you run the pipeline again, it's, it's only gonna run this discrete data and this report, it's gonna skip all this expensive work with the continuous model. Likewise, if we change a function, targets is going to detect the change, it knows the downstream functions and targets that depend on that, on that change and it automatically says, hey, this is, this is out of date now. And then when we run it again, it's a similar story. We, only the affected targets are recomputed. And when we, we look at this, this rendered report that our pipeline produced, we see that 91% of the credible intervals covered that, that true parameter from each simulation. And because our credible level was 90%, this model passed this validation test. And if we look at the posterior medians, plotted against the truth, we get pretty reasonable results. And the, 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 the cases where it didn't fit, they're, they're, they look pretty extreme. Um, well, not not, I, I guess not in some cases, but, um, but we, we do see the shrinking of the median estimates towards, towards the truth, which is actually pretty good for a Bayesian model to do. That's, that's the sort of behavior that you would expect. Or, or desire out of, out of a model like this. And at the end of the day, we have evidence of reproducibility. So we have evidence that the, the upstream, that, the, that the, your, your results at the end of the day are up to date with the code and data they were supposed to come from. And this, this is, th that, that claim is, you can, reach, you can reach evidence for that without having to rerun the pipeline for hours and hours. And that claim that things are that the results are synced is is a claim about being able to generate the output from the given materials, the the code and the and the data, 
And it's, it's just so, it speaks to the intent of reproducibility so directly that I think that pipeline tools like this and workflow automation are just as important to reproducibility as our markdown, just as important as our markdown, just as important as how you organize your files for readability and, and sort of where, where that your data sources come from, et cetera. This is, this is key for being, for being able to trust your results. So targets is not yet on CRAN. It's like I said, hot off the press and, but, but it is under review by our open sci right now. Um, so our open sci is this great community dedicated to open science and open data and reproducibility. And it's, uh, it, our open sci often reviews packages for, um, to be, to be onboarded into their, their collection of their collection of, of, of packages that, that align with their mission. And um, it's 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 going through serious checks by by um, by by trusted people in the community, and it's it's going to improve quite a bit over the next couple of months because of that. Um, after that, I'm going to release it to Cran, and um, but for and and at that point, you'll be able to install it from from Cran. But for now, you can install it from GitHub, like this. And there are a lot of resources to learn about it. So all the documentation is already there. So this repository has the code from today that I went over and the, the slides are online. There is a, a half day short course that I gave at the R Pharma conference recently. And those materials are online. It even has a publicly available R Studio cloud workspace. So anyone can take the workshop on their own. You don't need an instructor. You, you can. It's set up to be able to get just as much out of it independently. And there is a, a user manual and a reference website. And, and there are other examples like this one that I went over. There's, there's a machine learning example of Keras, and then there's a more minimal example. Um, OK, so after, before we go to questions, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to go over a couple of more things about this, this example. Um, that that I'm that I'm sharing. So, uh, first of all, can everyone still see? Can everyone see my R Studio IDE? Yes. yes. Perfect. All right. So we have a we have we have a situation where we've continuously rendered an R Markdown report. I use this technique all the time um, because sometimes to communicate with with my colleagues, whether it's validating a Bayesian model or rendering slides that I'm going to present on, on sort of a recommendation what to, with what to do in this clinical setting or, or whatever it may be. It's, it's extremely helpful to have a, a target downstream of this report that takes the, the HTML file and deploys it to our Studio Connect. Um, and it's such a common use case, and I wish I could show it to you, but um, I, I would need to, ex I would, I, for, for confidentiality reasons, I can't actually show what I'm doing with Connect, at least the, the Connect that I have access to. But I can show you another use case, which is continuous deployment of a Shiny app. So this is this has been and requested, and I've seen this done and and written about for Drake in the open source community. So there, there are situations where where you might want to run a pipeline, a, a long involved model fitting data analysis pipeline that at the end of the day produces a data set that, that has the results that you may want to explore and, and um, potentially iterate on. And this, this data set is wrapped into a Shiny app and you want to continuously deploy this Shiny app to shinyapps.io or RStudio Connect. And I have an example here that does this, that extends this Bayesian modeling workflow to do this. So you can give, get an idea perhaps more directly in the graph so I ran most of this pipeline locally. And the targets that I've added are the ones that produce this results file and track the source file of the Shiny app, and then finally deploy this app to our Studio Connect. Now here's what it looks like in the graph. So this deploy step depends on 
the results file that we've, that we've generated, and it depends on the app source file app.r. Um, the app is pretty simple, actually. It take, it's, a, it's a BS4 dash, dashboard, and all it really does is it reads the file, and then it renders a plot based on, on the settings that you have. And here's what it looks like locally. Um, so it has the plots the posterior means or posterior medians against the continuous or discrete version of the model. And rather than jamming a bunch of plots into the same visualization, um, it's, it's a lot nicer to, if you have a lot of plots to look at one interactive app and be able to select the plot that you want to see. So that's one reason why you might write a shiny app instead of, for example, a long report with every single plot that you might be interested in. Um, so if we forget this part for a second, I didn't mean to, to show that part. Um, it's the first time I'm presenting this piece. If we run this pipeline, actually first, let me go to the utilities. So I added a couple functions. And one of, the, one of these is, a function to deploy this app to shinyapps.io. So it takes the source file of the app, the code that it needs to run. It takes the, that's that app.r file. It takes the results data file that the pipeline worked so hard to produce for this app over many, many hours. And it's just this call to deploy app from the RS Connect package. And this is the key to continuous deployment in this case. Um, it just, it takes the, the files and you give it a name you give it your, your username. Um, you, you make sure that you want to, that it always updates and you select shinyapps.io as the destination. Um, and we have a target here to invoke de this deploy app function on, on its dependencies. When we run, when, when we run tar make, it's exactly what's, what's happening. Uh, so it is, it, it, it took a, a, bit, a bit long because it was running, it was loading the packages to start up um, that would need to run the, run the pipeline. Um, and right now it's, deploy, it's redeploying the app. Oh, I did not realize, oh, okay. I probably have to connect to uh, my VPN in order, in order for this to work. Um, apologies, this will only you. take a minute. What's that? And Zoom tends to drop you. Yeah. Oh, oh. Um, so if I. Yeah, he just connected to his VPN. <laughs> he'll, he'll automatically reconnect. <laughs> well, well, we'll wait for him to come back. Uh, this is an amazing tool, the type of stuff that R needs to uh, really productionalize our workflow. Yeah, it's really great. Were there any other pre-existing Drake users on the call? All right. Oh, I there he is. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Welcome yes. back. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, my work, I'm, I'm using my work computer because it connects to all my peripherals, but it's not always the best for for the kinds of, of things that I'm trying to do um, with, with this. Uh, so I guess I need my VPN on for proxy's sake, but um, let's, let's pause and take a look at the graph for a second. So previously this app source file was, was out of date because um, it was new, but now we see that, okay, this app source is up to date, which is great. I didn't, I didn't change it since last time. Um, you can set a file to automatically be tracked instead of um, some other some other kind of results. If you do the if you set this format equal to file option in in, in the the command for a target um, in the in the tar target function rather, um, and we see this deploy errored out, um, but that that has a chance of being fixed now that I've connected to the VPN. So let's see what happens when we run the pipeline again. It takes a little bit to, to start the, the background process um, and load some of the required packages. And here we are, the, the, now that we're on the VPN, the proxies are satisfied and, um, and now it's deploying the app. 
I guess I should check at this point since I reshare my screen. Can every can everyone see what's going on here? The, yes. With the IDE, perfect. Okay, and it's going through some steps at, to to build the app and install the the packages and create the container. And this this can take a while. And this is the, exactly the sort of thing that you might want to skip if your target's already up to date. Um, to say nothing of API limits for other kinds of services, etc. So eventually it's going to deploy to, um, to shinyapps.io, but in, in the meantime, while we're waiting for this, are there, I know I've, I've covered a lot. Um, are there any questions right now? We do have a question in the chat. Uh, yeah. Would the R markdown still knit if the called target is out of date? Yes. Um, so if, if the report source has changed or if the, um, or if, for example, fit discrete is out of date, it's since we we've loaded this 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 uh, this target, if any part of this is out of date, then then the report would re-knit, and I could I, I can demonstrate if if there's if there's time. So what tar render does is it crawls through your your code chunks in the R markdown, and automatically look for mentions of tar load or tar read. Those are sort of the magic keywords that it uses, and um, Any time that that it sees those, it it just says, "Okay, this is a dependency. If that dependency changes, re-knit the report." Um, and the reason the reason I I I chose to to go with that is that it also allows you to knit the report in the IDE just like this. Um, well, I, I got to remember to load more to load more packages. We can fix that and iterate on it just for the sake of demonstration. So. We have this app, and this is this is on shinyapps.io, and we have we we can see um, the different plots, etc. Um, but we notice that that there's, there's this awkward white space here, and so we'll want to change the app. Um, so right now everything's up to date. This this deploy step is up to date, um, but we're going to change the app pretty soon, and we're going to say. Um, We're going to, so everything's up to date, but we're going to, we're going to modify the app and we're going to, we're going to add a blank sidebar. We're going to, we're going to add a disabled sidebar, a sidebar of disabled equal to true. And because we tracked this app.r file, what tar viz net, what tar viz network is going to show us is an outdated app source and thus an outdated deploy target. And that is what we're seeing right here. And now if we run tar make again, that app source is gonna update, the actual app is gonna update and we should see a much more readable report. Much, much more readable app rather. So it already skipped the report. So what I'm going to do now is since it skipped the report, it's not worrying about that. I'm going to take this opportunity to go fix the package issue. So I'm going to say library. So let's just do library ggplot2. It should be enough. And so that is a change that targets will automatically detect and it'll rerun the report. The reason the report didn't error out last time is that the, the pipeline already needed to, to already loaded this, the, the package for active targets that it ran uh, because of the, the runtime packages that, that it set. So tidyverse was already part of those, that package suite. And in fact, because we already depend on the tidyverse Let's go ahead and change this to a whole tidyverse instead of ggplot2. No harm done here because we're already using it. Any more questions while this is uh, refreshing? Is it able to, or is there a need to provide weights on the DAG um, so that it knows what to prioritize different runs on so that you don't have a bottleneck? That's a great question. So 
in regular tar make it's um what what happens is it sorts the the graph just in topological order and um the the topological order that iGraph gives you and so there there isn't the ability to set priorities there but if you use a function like tar make future or tar make cluster mq then those functions talk to parallel backends priorities matter a whole lot more and you can actually set target specific priorities so you can go to something like um, if you if the discrete model is more important than the continuous model you want that to get done earlier you can say priority equals one so priorities and targets are are number or numerics between zero and one where one gets run run earlier than the than the zeros and you can uh, that you can set that at the at the user level um, but you would have to run something like tar make future to do that. So regular tar make doesn't uh, doesn't invoke that. But tar make future is pretty much like tar make. You would just if you don't set any options with future, um, for example, then you'll just get the the usual sequential execution, and it'll the results will pretty much be the same. All right. Thanks. So we've we've uh, refreshed the app, and if we reload it, the um, that awkward white space should be gone, and sure enough, it is. the The sidebar is is turned off, and this this app looks better, and it makes better use of real estate. Um, but before we we if we if we look at the graph, our workflow isn't quite up to date yet because we changed the report. So this report is is out of date because we wanted to make sure it had all the required packages in it. Um, we run it locally, and sure enough, it produces the results. Um, again, we get that 90% coverage, which is great. And um, likewise for, for both, uh, both alternative models. So we ran it locally. We, we know the report runs now. And so we can finally call Tarmake to synchronize everything. And so we have a fully up-to-date pipeline. All right, and that's everything that I that I have. Um, so thank you, thank you for your time and attention. Um, I uh, I know sometimes I started at the middle, sometimes I started near to the beginning, but hopefully you found something useful for your for your daily work. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? I know I have several. <laughs> Well, while people are finding their unmute button, um, I'll ask one that's on my mind. Uh, Clint, can you clarify the role of the the Tarkatypes package and what why you might want to load that along with targets? So Tarkatypes takes advantage of the extensibility at the interface level that targets has. So in in targets, you can resist through non-standard evaluation, and these target objects actually stand on their own. So if we run this outside of the of the pipeline, you will actually get an environment with a special class that is that is literally a target object, um, and this this kind of way things works allows the the target types package to to use that and develop a bunch more convenient bunch more sort of ways to interact with it, and the purpose of target types is to is just for usability and convenience. So it's shorthand for things that you might already define um, if, if you were left to your own devices, but maybe struggle with. So perhaps the best way to explain this is in the readme of Tarkatypes itself. So if we were to take tar render, for example, and that, that um, it's, it's super convenient in an actual pipeline, you give it, you give the target a name, you specify an R markdown source, and the, the tar render function automatically crawls through the report, gets the names of the dependencies, establishes the dependency relationships, and then automatically re-renders re the report when those dependencies change, or if the source itself changes. 
to, to do that locally, this is what that code would look like. To, to, I mean, to do this without, without a, a target archetype, you would have to establish, you would have to, to manually um, make some symbolic reference to each of, those, each of those targets that's mentioned in the report, which is really something you want done automatically. You would have to do that all manually here in this command. And then you would have to run the tar render, sorry, you would have to run the R markdown render function. You would need to specify the correct root directory. Remember the, the sort of paternalism is, is one of the things that, um, that, that targets, that, um, that, you know, that, that, that targets establishes. Um, for the sake of an automated pipeline, it's usually, it's usually nice to have the, the output suppressed. Um, you need to return the, the source, not only the, the source of the, um, of, the, of the report, but also the, the rendered output, sort of the files that are produced by, tar, by, by, by the render function are, are also returned here. And then these files are absolute paths, which isn't great for portability. And so you might want to call path rel to make sure that these are relative instead of absolute paths. Um, you want to make sure the return values are treated as a file as as files that targets tracks for changes, and you probably want to run it locally because because our markdown reports are usually fast if they're or they're supposed to be fast if you're if all you're doing is referencing targets, and so this adds up to a lot already, and you really want to condense this down because it's a super common use case, which is why we have tar render. It's sort of exactly the sort of thing that's. That, that makes it more convenient, that establishes a pattern, but may not actually belong in core targets itself. Because otherwise targets would be in a position where you'd have to catch individual use cases and that would, that would just add up to a lot. The feature creep would, be, would, would add up to a lot. Um, so target types establishes this pattern. At work, there's, there's actually similar simulation pipelines that, that we're developing that are specific for certain situations in the life sciences um, that are doing similar things, that are, that are establishing patterns and making them a lot more convenient, even if the actual use case is outside the scope of core targets. Uh, and, and I think this idea is going to allow people to, to extend this and build their own interfaces and you know, not only accommodate sort of use cases specific to their domain, but unleash you know your own creative freedom on this and and really run with it and own it that's what i'm trying to achieve with this so it seems like um this allows you to, to greatly manage the pipeline and as we were talking about makes it reproducible and my question is have you thought at all about making this um i mean i don't even know if you could with the with the code base but making it self-referential -ref for like submission purposes so self-referential in, in what sense? Anyone who runs it will automatically get the, the same result for either a qualified status or something? Or are you outside of the actual, um, I mean, like not, the work that you're doing here, for example, ultimately is, is not necessarily for submission purposes. Is that correct? Submission in what sense? Submigula submission to regulatory? FDA, yes, yeah. yeah. Oh regulatory yeah, regulatory authorities. Oh yeah, so you know, you know my industry, yeah. Um, so, cause you're seem so like you're very close. Um, meaning that you can see the, you can see the entire, you can see it all the way through. Um, but, but it, it's just the, um, with another group, we were working on the self-referential part of it. So that if the code ran, it would then also not only run, but it would pump out a report that would reference every part of it so that somebody could verify that every step was working exactly the right way. Oh, for okay. submission purposes. And I'm just curious if you guys were thinking about that at all or so if it's so the reporting at the end is what you what you describe as the missing link. Is that in your mind what's sort of Yeah, because it, it okay. substantiates that no one's tinkering with it in midstream, right? Right. So different different use cases are gonna have different targets that mean different things. Um, and so this is this is part of the reason why the report itself or the app itself, if, if, the app, if an app is part of the submission, which is a use case that's being explored, um, that's going to be so use case specific that it, needs to be, that it needs to be manually created. And, um, 
and th this is this is not going to be something that targets produces automatically for you. Um, but this is something that can be easily extensible for for let's say purposes for the purposes of life sciences industry for for FDA submissions, like you said. Exactly. Um, no, I wasn't. So I wasn't suggesting it would be in target, but I just wondered if you were had. Now that you've achieved this status, and this is absolutely remarkable. My question was, is I thought maybe you might have thought, well, hey, maybe I could take that next step and do that. I just was curious. I'm not yes, asking absolutely. you to do it. I'm just asking you if you were thinking about it. Yeah. So I, it depends on, um, on what exactly the, the, the product is. I feel like for, for clinical data pipelines that let's say you're at, you're at the end of the trial and you're, you're sort of analyzing the final readout, um, that, that really isn't always, you know, it, if, especially depending on what kinds of computations are involved, it may only run once. And, um, I mean that, so, well, no, no backtrack point. that, backtrack I, that. Uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't, I didn't. I actually think you're right there. You're on, you're right on, uh, you're right. In that sense, and I don't want to get off track here and down a rabbit trail, but in, in that sense, you're absolutely right. It's probably so customized. You only need to run it once and, and therefore you can document it and therefore you're done. I guess what I was, I was kind of envisioning that um, uh, a, a future state where people are using um, other things as this, uh, let me say it this way, they're using computational capability as a service, let's say for something crazy like dosing, where you would actually yeah. run that thing again and again and again and again and again. Yeah, and that's certainly perfect for that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's, that's certainly what, um, in, in the design of trials where we're, we're constantly iterating on designs and, and iterating on models, um, this, this comes into play a lot. Um, I mean, I've been busy with COVID-19 trial planning a lot, especially in the spring. And we've been using Drake actually before targets almost in every single case, my, my group and I, that, that the trials that we've, we've contributed to. And um, this, I mean, the, the, the simulation pipeline for sort of reproducibility purposes, design purposes, may be submitted to sort of um, or external collaborators and, and regulators in, in that sense. Um, but I mean, so the, the real benefits you see in, in these, these development pipelines and sort of even at the end of, even for the end of trials, if you're developing an analysis on practice data, all you do is really, really sub in the real data when database slot comes around and, um, and the pipeline is already set up, already been developed, and targets really helps get to that point. Um, so I, I guess this, I, I think this can be used at sort of any stage, even if it is only running once. The the development process that you get there, the, the you get there to use that, depending on your computational needs, can certainly help. Um, the reporting structure, I, the the report is going to, I I believe it's it. What I'd like to, to see and what, what has been successful is a report that does as little as possible, that all it does is load targets. Even this code is, is a lot. So this plot could, could ideally be a target of its own. And, and that could leave a lot more room for, for pros and explanatory pros and to just um, to make the report run a lot faster. Um, and, and, and this kind of report, I think that does li as little as possible that makes references to targets that are already computed and explains those targets is well, I think it's already well within reach with, the, um, with, with this, this use case. Um, but I mean, I think what I have seen and what I have seen um, sort of being practical and, and sort of people being receptive to it in, in sort of my work environment is, is simulation and design rather than the rather than submissions um i'm struggling to change mind still i think we've won on the simulation front but um it's there there is still there is still more convincing to be done um and there's still more opportunities to be explored especially because a lot of these computations in the final readout of try in the final readouts of trials are are really cheap um, if, if you're, you're running sort of easy models and all you're doing is, is sort of re reporting and, and stuff, um, n not as many trials, I mean, depending, depending on, on sort of what your, your analysis methods are, um, what, what models you're, you're, you're actually using in the, in the final product. Um, I mean, which could lead to a development pipeline, but I mean, from what I've talked to, um, you know, people who are working on these on these pipelines and in 
at that at that final stage, they're they're currently dealing with a different set of problems and grappling with the transition from SaaS to R. So it's it's going to be a while. Um, all right. So to, I, just to not to monopolize your time, but I want to ask you just two quick questions. Now that you're on target, um, how often do you go back to Drake? Um, so I don't really use Drake in um, in I mean personally um, in except for for legacy projects. Okay, but Drake yeah. is always going to be there. I get and it, but, but but you've moved on, and that that kind of brings me to the the, the last question. That and I don't want to cut you off. I want you to continue. But the last question I just want to squeeze in, and that is: so now that you're here, it's like, do you have that? Hey, how did I live without this kind of thing? Because it looks so. Um, reproducible and so easy, it makes me wonder, wow, your job is a lot easier now. And is that how you actually experience it? Yeah. So um, I felt like I, I've the, 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 the time where I felt that the most is, um, is actually, well, well, with each new package that I've either developed or come across sort of at the beginning, that first project is where it really hits. Um, so I actually, before Drake, there was a package called Remake. And it was, it was the first attempt that I have seen to create a make-like pipeline tool designed for R. And that's what all this is modeled after, actually. It extends the idea. It extends it to places where I think it needed to go. But that was the first place that I've seen it. And it was so refreshing to be able to, have, to, be able to, to write functions to express the work and to be able to, um, to, to sort of to, to, to be able to skip this expensive computation and have a clean R focused workflow. Um, and then Drake, um, you know, the, taking it to things that I, things that I grappled with in the interface of, of remake, the reliance on YAML files, the, to, for configuration, just kind of like its own make file. And, and some of the awkwardness around, around, around that and the awkwardness around high performance computing, um, when that got solved, it was another thing. And then, and then the, um, when, when I, I first, my, my first reaction to, and, and which is what I sort of expected to using targets for a, for a project, um, the, the, I immediately felt more at ease because I knew that it was handling the dependencies on functions and, and clean sessions and, and data management. I felt like, you know, over years of using Drake for projects personally, I was sort of bracing myself for surprises of, of the brittleness of functions being out of date, being in the wrong directory, um, Drake automatically detecting the wrong data store, things like that. And I, I just, I, because of how I knew I designed targets, I, I knew that there were things that I could trust now in the tool that I, I couldn't necessarily, um, I, that I had to be vigilant about in Drake. And it was just this sense of, of ease um, when I first, um, when I, when I first implemented my, uh, uh, the first target project with targets. Awesome. Thank you. We had, uh, one, we had another question in the chat. Um, can functions be stateful? How, how does target, uh, detect changes? <laughs> so targets detects changes by, um, in, in functions specifically by taking I mean, by deparsing or converting to text the, the function body and the signature, which is the name plus the, the, the arguments. Well, the arguments specifically in this case. Um, and what it does is it takes that, that string representation and computes a hash or a fingerprint of, of that string. And then it stores, it, it hashes, okay, it hashes the, the deparsed function along with the, a, a hash of all the dependencies. So it sort of recursively um, propagates any invalidation downstream. Um, but that's sort of the idea that there's, that the function gets converted into text. You take a function at face value. So you don't worry about what's in the closure of the function and you don't worry about the, the kind of the, the state that it stores in its own environment. Um, the, if it depends on a global variable to track state then that global variable should also be in in your um, in the same environment that you define in which you define your functions, which is usually going to be the global environment, um, and then it, it tracks those global variables and it, um, which the function depends on. Now, I don't recommend using global state for for this kind of data analysis. Data analysis is very um, and data science is inherently functional. So it, it, it's 
a fitting a model or producing a data set, those are, those are sequences of, of data transformations. And those are very naturally, very naturally functions. Um, and those, those functions should, should take all the arguments that they need if they're pure, which sort of make, makes new workflows a lot easier to implement and ultimately maintain. They should take arguments um, and they should, they should be as side effect free as possible and return a single understandable, readable, um, both human readable and machine readable value, um, or at least convenient to work with um, at, at the end. So the, the purity of functions makes a lot of, makes all of this easier. Um, so that's, I guess that's, that's what I recommend as far as global state or, or the state of a function. So if your function is, is like a, a Python iterator, for example, um, then, then it's, it's not going to work as well. Um, if, if targets have targets resists side effects because the, the, the execution of order of the, of the targets, especially in a parallel computing setting depends on the topological order, not in any kind of sequential order that you would intuitively conceive of. And so, um, if calling a function changes some internal state that, that some, that the next target uses, um, then, then that's. Um, that tends to be contrary to the paradigm. It makes things a little bit more difficult to use and, and it leads to surprises. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Great. Um, well, thank you so much uh, uh, for the presentation. Um, this was this was really excellent. Uh, we're cool. really happy that you were able to make it. Um, and it uh, looks like um, Amy uh, dropped some links to uh, the slides and the materials in the chat uh, if you missed that. Um, anybody think of anything before we wind down here? Okay, um, so um, thanks to everybody uh, for coming. Thanks especially to, to Will uh, for this uh, presentation and for um, all the great work in the community. Um, it, it, Drake has, uh, in addition to being just a really excellent um, addition to my workflow, also has had just like such incredible documentation and resources to it and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm really appreciative uh, for all the work, work that uh, Will and his, his collaborators have done to make this tool really great. And so um, super, super excited about targets and I really appreciate you coming to present. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, meetups like this really help spread the word and uh, I'm just excited to share and, and uh, excited to see where, where this goes, this new stage of the journey. Um, and thanks, thanks to, for your, um, for your feedback too. This is, these are great questions. Um, and, uh, I, I know this in the R community, this, this, this way of, of looking at workflows is often strange and, and counterintuitive. Um, and, and these questions that, that I heard today ha hit, hit a lot of those, a lot of those points. All right. Thanks so much. Um, I think we had we had a, a pretty full session here. So I think uh, unless um, uh, Amy or and John, if you have anything you want to add, I, th I think this would be a good time to wrap up. For me, just thank you very much, Will. This was great. I love seeing tools like this that take our sort of off the laptop and make it a full full competitor production tool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.